Okay, good morning, everyone. Yeah, a rather subdued good morning, maybe because of the dull weather here. Uh, but yes, if we could have someone commit this class into the Lord's hands, if, we, if someone can open with a word of prayer, please. Okay, as nobody wishes to pray, let I'll pray. yes, let us pray. Lord, we want yes. to thank you for gathering us once again at the starting of the week. We are grateful for the weekend and the less that we receive from you. And now, Lord, as we continue to explore more of you in your word, would you guide us? Would you go ahead of us? Would your spirit make us one and bring us to that understanding? Praise our teacher, our pastor, as you use her, dear Lord, as a vessel to share your truth. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much. Yeah. So uh, last week, we were looking at Ezra and Nehemiah. Um, we covered some of the main events which took place in the book of Ezra. Uh, we looked at the timeline. We looked at um, which event took place during the reign of which Persian king. And then we moved into Nehemiah, but there was not much time left. Uh, so we could not look at some aspects of uh, Nehemiah as a governor and as a leader. Very briefly, we talked about uh, the burden on his heart for Jerusalem, how in spite of the risk which is there for his life and his position, he goes to the king, uh, he requests the king for permission to return back to Jerusalem so that he can help in the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. So we see um, the complete commitment and loyalty that he has towards the purposes of God. We also looked at the fact that he is a secular officer. He was not a, a priest or a prophet. He was not in ministry. And yet he chose to place God's purposes first, even before his position, even before his job. Uh, so we see that uh, heart in Nehemiah. We also very briefly around the end of the class, try to look a little bit at the kind of man that he was as a leader. Uh, we looked at, uh, at the fact that he was different from all the other governors who generally used to you know, rule this entire Mediterranean uh, region under the Persian rule. Uh, so uh, we could not really get much into that last time. But then in chapter 5, uh, and I know I think I misquoted the chapter last time because I could not um, locate it. Uh, it, in, it. It is in chapter 5 where it talks about how the other governors uh, used to live a very luxurious lifestyle. But compared to them, Nehemiah lives in a very humble manner. Uh, so that actually is in um, Nehemiah chapter 5 uh, where uh, he says in verse 17 that Every day, uh, you know, uh, he's the governor. So all the people working under him, the main officials, uh, will generally uh, come and, uh, you know, have their meals uh, at his uh, re uh, residence. Um, I mean, there would be a public dining hall over there, and everyone would gather over there, and then they would eat their meals over there. Uh, so... One of the reasons why the governor was given a personal tax, you know, the people would pay a personal tax to him personally, apart from the taxes which they generally give to the Persian government. It's because this governor has got these additional responsibilities. So that daily three meals which take place uh, for all the officials, that will come on his tab, you know, so he would have to pay for that. Uh, so uh, therefore, there's a tax which is specifically given to the governor uh, apart from all the other taxes which the people have to pay because the governor has to take care of all the expenses of the administration and also feeding of all of these officials. So in verse 17, he touches upon that. He says, uh, furthermore, 150 Jews and officials um, ate at my table as well as those who came to us from the surrounding nations each day, uh, one ox, six choice sheep, and some poultry were prepared for me. And every 10 days, an abundant supply of wine of all kinds 
and so you know the expenses would be high so generally the governor of a region would use the taxes which are coming to him personally to pay for these things but he says over here in spite of all this i never demanded the food allotted to the governor because the demands were heavy on these people so rather than asking the people to pay for all of these food preparations on a daily basis he used to bear the expenses of the food on his own from his own personal pocket rather than taking taxes so it brings out two points one that nehemiah must have been a highly wealthy person to be able to even afford to do something like this and also the humble nature that he has where instead of collecting taxes like all the other governors of that entire region he does not take taxes because he says already the demands are so heavy on the people the people can't bear to pay even more the persian ga uh, government is taking a lot of their uh, you know a big cut of their crops goes to the persian government and they are managing with what they have now if i also start taking taxes from them what will their condition be because he never forgets the fact that he is a jew like them they are his family and so even though they are not family by blood he cares about them um i mean uh, you know with ratan tata passing away recently uh, there were a lot of uh, leadership quotes which were being uh, you know displayed in the newspapers and in the magazines uh, there was one particular quote, quotation which caught my eye um he he says um leadership is not about being in charge it is about taking care of those who are in your charge so leadership is not just about being in charge and boasting and saying ha here i am on top i can do what i want so leadership is not about being in charge it is about taking care of those who are in your charge and nehemiah did that he took care of the people who were in his charge so in that same chapter chapter 5 itself we see another uh, example of his leadership um this would be in uh, verses uh, yeah in the beginning of the chapter chapter 5 verse 1 onwards um where the poorer jews you know are um suffering a lot because of the high taxes so because most of what they are able to produce in the fields is going away to the persian empire um they are in uh, poverty and as a result of that they are having to take loans from the rich jews and the and the rich jews are charging very high interest rates which they are unable to pay back and when they are unable to pay back the high interest rates they are forced to give their sons and daughters as slaves to the rich jews so when nehemiah gets to know about this he is extremely angry um this is what he says um in uh, verse 6 maybe if you could have someone read out for us verses 6 to 8 uh, nehemiah chapter 5 verses 6 to 8 please and i was very angry when i heard their cry and these words that i consulted with myself and i rebuked the nobles and the rulers and said unto them a exhort exhort usury every one of his brother and i set a great assembly against them and i said unto them we after our ability have redeemed our brethren the jews which were sold unto the heathen and will ye even sell your brethren or shall they be sold unto us then held they their peace and found nothing to answer yeah um i wish we could have people read out from simple english you know uh, translations where we can actually understand the english which is being you know um, Uh, spoken over there uh, this is what he says you know in uh, in the normal english which we use today uh, he says um, as far as possible we have bought back our fellow jews who were sold to the gentiles now you are selling your own people you know so he basically says those of the jews who you know had had to pay high uh, interest rates to the gentiles somehow we gathered money and we redeemed them from the slavery and now you are making your own people into slaves i mean isn't this shameful these are your family members these are all your fellow israelites how can you do this 
and so he you know he's extremely angry with them and then it says over there in that last line which we read out it says they kept quiet because they could find nothing to say because what they were doing is so shameful uh, it's one thing if the gentiles make the israelites into slaves but these people were doing that to their own people and so nehemiah says you must not charge interest from your people if they, if they if they need a loan you give them the loan and then they will repay it but you're not supposed to collect interest rate on that because that's something which even moses had ordered even moses had commanded uh, earlier so uh, we see that here is a leader who takes care of those who are in his charge for him the big thing is not being in charge for him the big thing is taking care of those who are in his charge um Let's also just look at a couple of um, uh, other aspects of his leadership. Um, two ways in which he, uh, you know, he expresses his um, his loyalty towards the Lord, and as a result of which he is very strict. You know, two matters on which he is very strict. One example of that we see in uh, Nehemiah thirteen verses twenty three to twenty five. Uh, if someone could actually read out nehemiah 13 23 to 25 please nehemiah 13 and i count uh, and in those days also saw i jews and that had married wives of ashdod of ammon and of moab and their children sp sp spoke half in the speech of Azdob and could not speak in the Jews' language, but according to the language of each people. And I con condemned, condemned with them and cursed them and spoke certain of them and plucked off their hair and made them swear by God, saying, He shall not give you daughters unto their sons, nor their daughters unto your sons, for, for your slaves. Okay, um, it doesn't say your slaves, it says yourselves. Uh, so, oh yeah, so we see over here in Nehemiah 13 um, that these Jewish people have married outsiders. And because they have married outsiders, they have not even bothered to learn the Hebrew language. So the scriptures which have been given by the Lord have been written out in the Hebrew language. And these people are not in a position to, a position to even read the scriptures because they do not even know the language and so nehemiah is so upset in fact uh, in um, chapter 8 i think is where we see uh, where all the people come together and they make a commitment and they say now onwards we will follow the ways of the lord and ezra stands in front of them and he reads out the the laws of moses and he reads it out in the hebrew language because it is written in the hebrew language and the people cannot even understand what is being said so then someone translates for the people whatever is being read out of the law of Moses so that at least the people will know what is being read. So Nehemiah is very angry that this is the way the people treat the things of God. For them, the other things are all first priority. The things of God are not even important. So he is upset that because they have married foreigners, they have chosen to teach the language of the foreigners to the to the children so that the children will not even know hebrew and if they do not know hebrew in the next generation will they even bother to read the scriptures so you see that is why he scolds them it says i rebuked them and called curses down on them and in fact he says i beat some of the men and pulled out their hair so this is not some soft uh, leader who doesn't know how to take a stand for the lord he is kind out of his own pocket, he pays for people to slay, you know, redeem them from slavery. From his pocket, he pays for the food of people uh, because the, he knows that the common man cannot, you know, pay taxes to him. He's a kind hearted person. But when it comes to taking a stand for justice, when it, uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, upholding the standards of the Lord, there is no softness there. He is very strict regarding those matters. So this is an important leadership lesson to learn. Yes, we must be loving and gentle towards the people you know, in our charge. But when it comes to matters of justice, 
when it comes to placing the priorities of the kingdom first and we see someone who is taking those things lightly then we would need to be strict so we see that about uh, nehemiah who does not take these things lightly um another example that we find in nehemiah chapter 13 uh, is how the you know the temple premises so uh, uh, right in the middle you would have the holy place and the most holy place and then you know you have the altar over there anyone who has seen the blueprint of the tabernacle will you know know how the arrangement is but uh, around that immediate temple uh, you know area you have all the other buildings where you have uh, the grains being stored uh, where you have the priest staying the guards who will be protecting the temple they you know they have their own their own rooms over there so you have an entire temple complex around the main central temple and um, so in that temple premises uh, you have the priest elia ship i think this was his name um, this man yeah elia ship he so recklessly he brings in an outsider he brings in an ammonite official and places him in some of those rooms and when nehemiah gets to know about it he is so angry it says uh that he literally throws out the things of that man from that room you know he has it all removed uh because uh yeah it say that's in uh, nehemiah 13 verse 5 he says i was greatly displeased and threw all tobias household goods out of the rooms i gave orders to purify the rooms and then i put back into them the equipment of the house of god with the grain offerings and the income so this eliashib the priest just to curry the favor of this very important ammonite official is allowing him to use um the temple rooms for some other official purposes and uh, nehemiah does not put up with that once he gets to know about it you know because he goes he goes back to persia for a short while and this happens during that time so when he comes back and he gets to know how the temple area is being used by ammonites he is angry because the lord had commanded that the ammonites will not even enter into the temple premises and here is a man who is literally living over there and doing his work out of the uh, that premises so he has that person removed and he purifies the rooms so leadership is um one side of leadership is about being kind uh, being considerate being gentle but the other side is uh, being fervent and strict when it comes to matters of the lord and the kingdom the same attitude which jesus took jesus the servant leader the 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 best servant leader anyone could ever find you know who was so humble and gentle uh, when it came to the temple and the misuse of the temple you know he literally whips those um, people who have turned the temple into a marketplace so true leadership uh, has a gentle side to it true leadership also has that deep fervor and loyalty to the lord where you will not bend if someone is taking god you know very very lightly so we see that about nehemiah's leadership um uh, we've kind of eaten up into 20 minutes of today's class so let's move into esther uh, esther and anyway, we does not need much time because we are familiar with the story line so we'll try to dwell upon points which you may not be that familiar with you know uh, from the book of esther the book of esther i think is mainly about uh, displaying the sovereignty of god and the deep love that he has for his people even when they are scattered to you know uh, over all the other regions i mean these israelites these jews are not even they didn't even bother coming back to jerusalem they are in comfortable positions abroad they are in high position some of them and they are happy to stay there they have no love for their homeland and they don't really want to come back so you have a large number of people moving you know uh, into egypt uh, from babylon some of them moved towards persia including nehemiah you know who went over there and got into a very high official position so you have people spread out all over uh, the entire um, uh, trans euphrates region and uh, so in spite of their being in these pagan places the lord's eye is still upon them you know one thing which they say about the book of esther the word god is not mentioned even once in the entire book of esther the word god is not mentioned even once 
but if you look at the way uh, at all the events which take place in this book every single one of those events is orchestrated by god himself he arranges things in such a way that everything works out in favor of his people who chose not to even come back to their homeland he still loves them he still cares about them and he uses even them for his purposes for instance nehemiah you know nehemiah chose to stay over there in the persian uh, you, know, um, uh, you know empire rather than coming back home but god uh, you know sees his heart and uses him in a very significant way for his kingdom purposes through nehemiah's efforts the walls of jerusalem are rebuilt in the same way uh, the lord continues to have his eye upon the people in all, in all these other scattered regions uh, so coming to this book of esther we see that now uh, this is the reign of our uh, of uh, zeres so darius son darius was uh, is generally known as darius the great because under him uh, the persian empire reached its widest expanse so it was under darius that the kingdom now extended all the way from southern egypt up to northwestern pakistan you know uh, so uh, in uh, esther chapter 1 verse 1 when it says india over there it's not talking about you know current india uh, it's talking about northwestern pakistan so if you look at the map that's like a huge expanse of territory all the way from southern egypt you know it goes all the way across the continent and literally comes into uh, you know our uh, subcontinent uh, comes all the way up to northwestern pakistan that is the large extent of the empire which darius builds up so under his son zeres um, you know the kingdom is now in a very established uh, state and the uh, the the status and the position has gone to zeres head and he's not exactly a very pleasant person uh, so we see that he has some uh, initial victories of his own um, during you know when when he first comes to the throne egypt and uh, the province of babylon they revolt against him but he is able to successfully put down those rebellions uh, and so he's feeling very confident about himself as a king as a military leader um, so he is basically in that position so it's probably after these conquests uh, you know where he has successfully suppressed the egyptian rebellion and also you know defeated all the people from the province of babylon who rose up against him it's after these victories that probably he throws this lavish celebration uh, where he invites the most important officials and maybe even some of the rulers from the surrounding places and they've all gathered over here for this great celebration and um, the uh, you know uh, like it says over there in esther chapter 1 the festivities go on for a few days and then uh, you know when uh, when they are all in that uh, very drunken celebratory condition uh, he commands that his uh, the queen should come you know and um, uh, show herself to them but then she refuses because um, she probably would have been from a noble family so she is from a, a high status so she doesn't like to be treated like as if she's a concubine the concubines can be you know treated uh, any way that the king wants to treat them but she has some status she has dignity so she doesn't want to come over there and you know uh, mingle with a bunch of drunken uh, men and so she refuses uh, so uh, zares wife washti refuses to come over there and uh, it's like an of um it's like a humiliation for him that his wife refused to come when he ordered that she should come you know what will people think about his power and his status so it is under those circumstances that he decides that she is no longer going to be the chief uh, queen mother and so um, you know he decides to replace her uh, with another um, queen uh, so which is why they start looking for uh, suitable candidates who can be given this chief position you know so that is how the search begins and esther uh, is um, caught up in the number you know um, among the women who are brought over there not sure how many of them willingly came not sure how many of them uh, you know were happy to come uh, because of the money and the status which they would get uh, 
because I don't think it's really very wonderful to be married to a horrible man like Zeres, you know, who probably already has got multiple wives. So anyway, it was very sad, uh, the position of women in those days. So yeah, so whether Esther wants it or not, she's brought over there to the palace along with a whole bunch of other uh, women who they think would qualify for this position. And so they, you know, they, they, they start training them up for the, um, the thing of, for the position ahead. And so the general belief is that um, while this, you know, this entire search is going on for the new queen, that is basically when they say most probably uh, um, this uh, Zeres, who is now, you know, full of military pride because of his successes, he decides to go and um, uh, conquer Greece. He thinks that he is in a position to be able to defeat them. So along with his army, he marches out to Greece, but uh, he suffers a very humiliating defeat over there um, because, um, you know, Greece is now quite powerful because they are, in fact, going to be the next great power which is going to come. Uh, so, you know, the first was the Assyrians, then they went off, Babylonians took over, then they also went off. Now you have the Persians, the next uh, will be the Greeks. So right now, Greece is gaining power. So when Zeres goes out against Greece and tries to conquer it, he uh, actually loses quite badly. And uh, we have a record of these historical events uh, in the uh, book written by Herodotus. Okay, so Herodotus, a historian, has written something called the histories in which he talks about these events. So after this defeat, when um, Zeres comes back, he would have come back rather humiliated, in rather a bad mood, I would say. So this is basically when you know they have, uh, you know, tried to choose a new um, uh, queen. So it is under these circumstances that Esther is able to win him over, and uh, you know um, she gains his favor, and that's basically how she uh, becomes the new queen. So the Lord's favor was upon her and the Lord, uh, because of the heart that she had, the Lord decided that this would be a person who will do something for his kingdom purposes. So uh, maybe with that intention, he allows her to gain favor with the king. And so Esther is, you know, is able to get that uh, high position. And uh, we are familiar with most of the story, so we'll not get into the details, uh, but you know, um, just to remind us of the fact that her uncle Mordecai, you know, uh, refuses to bow down to Haman. So uh, the chief, one of the chief officials of um, of Zeres is a man named Haman. Um, in the in the writings of uh, Herodotus, they call this position the 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 position of the Kiliar, C H I L I A R C H. Okay, so. Um, uh, Haman is the Kiliarch, the chief official in uh, during the time of Zeres. And uh, uh, so whenever he goes out in, in public, everyone bows down to him to show respect to him and all of that. But Mordecai refuses to bow to Haman. And um, the people find this a little puzzling because you know generally when somebody so important comes along, people will bow down out of respect. But Mordecai refuses to do that. So a question which can be asked is, why did Mordecai refuse to bow down to Haman? Because he refused to bow down to Haman, all the other events which followed took place. If he had just simply bowed down to him, everything would have you know, gone on as uh, smoothly as usual. So why did he do that? Did he do the right thing? Did he do the wrong thing? Uh, what are we to understand from this? So um, we'll just look at some details. Some people say that you know he did not want to worship Haman and therefore he was refusing to bow down. Uh, but then um, all the people who were bowing down to Haman were not doing it because they were worshiping him, but because he is of a, in an important position. Uh, if you look at the Israelites, they too had a practice of bowing down in front of important um, dignitaries. In the sense, you know, if you go right back to your, your Genesis, in Genesis chapter 33, verse 3, you have Jacob, you know, when he goes to meet his brother Esau, 
um, he bows down to the ground seven times and he most definitely was not worshipping his brother when he bowed down. So bowing down is something that you do out of respect. But Mordecai refused to show this respect to Haman. Why? Uh, to understand that, let's look at a little bit of background. Um, if you were to go to um, Exodus chapter 17, verse 14, it talks about a certain people group over there. So if someone could read out for us uh, Exodus 17, verse 14, please. And the Lord said to Moses, write this in a book as something to be remembered and tell it in the hearing of Joshua because I will completely blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. The Amalekites, you know, they attack the Israelites immediately after they have crossed the Red Sea. They are in a very uh, helpless state. Uh, you know, the Egyptians were after them. Then the Lord miraculously opens up the sea for them. So they're able to cross over and they're just taking, you know, a breath of relief, saying, you know, glad that they have been saved. And when they're in this vulnerable condition, the Amalekites come and attack them. So the Lord, you know, holds that against them. And the Lord says, I will wipe out these Amalekites because of what they have done to my people. And then, of course, you have many other uh, uh, hostile interactions between the two communities. Uh, you know, so that's also there. So during the time of Saul is when the Lord says, you know, I want to now use you, Saul, to wipe out these Amalekites. So Samuel comes and delivers that message to Saul. Uh, that would be in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 1 to 3, where, Sa where Samuel comes and tells Saul, the Lord wants you to go and attack the Amalekites and destroy them. Um, if may, maybe if, if we could have someone read out for us, 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 3. 1 Samuel 15, verse 3. Now go and attack Amalek and uh, utterly destroy all, the, all that they have and do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, infant and nursing child, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. So the Lord had made a promise in Exodus that he would uh, you know, take his revenge against the Amalekites. So now the Lord is fulfilling it. Now that you know Israel has a king, uh, a, 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 an established king, the Lord says, now it's time for me to you know, do what I promised. So Saul is supposed to destroy all of the Amalekites. He's not supposed to spare any of them. But look at what Saul does in disobedience to the Lord, direct disobedience. Uh, 15 verse 9, 1 Samuel 15 verse 9. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the, uh, and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fa uh, fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good, and were unwilling to utterly destroy them, but everything despite, uh, despised and worthless that they utterly destroyed. So the Saul and his army deliberately disobey the Lord who said that even the cattle should be destroyed, but they spare all the cattle which no, they think you know they can sell and they can make money out of. And they also spare the king, the Amalekite king Agag, his life is also spared. Okay, so we've got to understand the background. The Lord was against the Amalekites. The Amalekites um, on many occasions treated Israel very, very badly. And also, we got to remember the fact that Agag at one point was the king of the Amalekites. So keeping all that background in mind, if we were to look at Esther chapter 3 verse 1, then everything clicks into place. So if someone could read out for us, Esther chapter 3 verse 1. After these things, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, the son of Hamedatha, the Agagite, and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes who were with him. 
Yeah, so Ahasuerus is the Hebrew uh, name. Zeres is the Greek name. Okay, so you would have different translations using either of these names. So Zeres and Ahasuerus are basically talking about the same person. Uh, Zeres being the Greek uh, name. Uh, so um, Zeres, he honors Haman. And here we get to know Haman's lineage. We get to know that this man is the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite. So this actually is a Amalekite from the royal lineage. Haman is directly from the Amalekite royal lineage. So maybe it was this hatred between the two communities, or maybe there were spiritual reasons. We do not know. Mordecai refuses to bow down to Haman. OK, so um, uh, but it creates a lot of problems. So was he justified in doing this? Was he not justified in doing this? Uh, we do not know because there are two different opinions regarding this. Um, so when if we know that some official in power is very crooked, very wicked, and in fact, we have heard that this person has been uh, cruel to the Christian community. So should we be like uh, Mordecai? refuse to bow down, refuse to show respect? Or should we be wise, like Jesus said? You know, so there are two viewpoints. There are some who will say, no, no, Mordecai was justified in not bowing down to Haman. A man like that from Agagite lineage, no, no, no. He, he, it's good that he didn't bow down. There are others who will say, but because he didn't bow down, it led to so many complications. It didn't just affect Mordecai's life. The entire Jewish community would have lost their lives because of this one, you know, act of um, of, of you know bold rebellion. I mean, imagine innocent uh, Jews who didn't contribute to Mordecai's decision would all have been massacred. So there are some who say that Mordecai should have just been wise regarding this and been careful. Uh, so Jesus, you know, he says in Matthew 10, 16 to 20. I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. The people out there are going to be wolves. And you are, you are sheep. You know, you can be torn apart. Therefore, the Lord says, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Be on your guard. So the Lord is saying, you know, you're going to be walking out among hostile people who don't care about the church, who don't care about Christ. So when you're walking among them, be as shrewd as snakes. Don't be silly. You know, don't be naive. Be very clever, very careful, very intelligent in dealing with them. But when it comes to evil, be innocent. Never participate in evil. So that is an advice which the Lord gives. Maybe, you know, it would have been good advice for Mordecai. That's, again, my own opinion. Okay, so if someone would... Uh, differs and says, no, it's a good thing which he did and not bowing down to Haman. I mean, they would be justified. Uh, so my opinion is that maybe he should have been a little more diplomatic. For instance, when it comes to Paul, Paul was always most polite with all the governors, with all the officials that he came across. You know, he didn't say, I'm not going to bow down to you because you're a heathen. No, so... Um, it helps to be wise in on some occasions. So anyway, because of what Mordecai has done, uh, it brings wrath upon that entire community um, of the Jews. So uh, in Esther chapter 3, verses 3 to 4, uh, the, the people... Okay, maybe we should actually read out those verses. Um, yeah, if you could have someone uh, read out Esther 3, 3 to 6. Yeah. Then the king's servant who were within the king's gate said to Mordecai, who do you uh, transgress the king's command? Now it happened when they spoke to him daily, and he will not listen to them, that they told it to Haman to see whether Mordecai's word, words will stand. For Mordecai had told them that he was a Jew. When Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow or pay him homage, Haman was filled with wrath. But he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had told him of the people of Mordecai. Instead, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews who were 
throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, the people of Mordecai. Exactly. So here, uh, the people say to Mordecai, why do you want to disobey the king? The king said everyone should honor him. Why are you not honoring him? So when he refuses to do it, then they go and tell Haman. It says, therefore, they told Haman about it to see whether Mordecai's behavior would be tolerated. For he had told them that he was a Jew. So they wanted to know how Haman, the Agagite, would react when he gets to know that Mordecai, a Jew, is refusing to. So they, you know, they deliberately instigated the whole uh, situation. And once Mordecai, uh, once Haman gets to know that this man, a Jew, is refusing to bow to him, it's he, you know, he thinks, oh, it's a, it's a, it's a very um, simple thing to just kill this man. I'm going to kill this entire community, you know, is what he decides in his heart. And that's basically how this crisis comes upon the people's heads. And uh, it is uh, this lady, Esther, you know, who's innocently sitting there in the palace. She is the one person who can do something about it. I mean, she didn't want to be sucked into this whole matter. But, you know, uh, this is what Mordecai says to her, right? I mean, we are all highly familiar with that. Uh, verse, uh, you know, which um, Mordecai speaks to her in uh, Esther chapter 4, verse 14. Uh, yeah, if someone could read out for us that Esther 4, verse 14. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, but you and, but you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Yeah, you know, he says, maybe the reason God placed you in this position is so that you can do something for God. And, uh, you know, she agrees. She uh, So she was actually in a very safe and secure position. You know, we are, she's now the chief queen in uh, the most affluent and respected empire of that time. Um, you know, in uh, chapter 1, where it talks about the grandeur of the Persian Empire under Zeres, it talks about, um, you know, in chapter 1, when he's throwing that uh, feast, uh, it talks about how there were, uh, in chapter 1, verse 6, it says, there were couches of gold and silver on a mosaic pavement, uh, and something and all, it goes on, uh, you know, talk about uh, the grandeur of the place. And uh, Herodotus, in his writings, he says, that this is not gold plated couches. You know, you don't have a gold plating on top of a couch made of wood. They're actually made of solid gold. I mean, the entire couch is literally made of solid gold. So um, the kingdom under Darius and under Zerus was just too powerful. They were too rich. They were extremely wealthy. And she is the chief queen of that empire. So you can imagine the comforts and the luxuries that she would have enjoyed. Now her uncle is asking her to risk everything to save her people. And why is that really a risky and dangerous thing? Um, this is what Esther says to her uncle. I know she uh, she speaks uh, to him in uh, Esther chapter 4 verse 11. And she says, you know, the king has not asked for me in 30 days which means at the moment is lost interest in me. You know, he's probably chasing other women. So he's not even interested in her right now. So when she's in that uh, position of disfavor, let us say, if she were to approach him without permission, there's a chance that he can actually have her killed. So from the uh, writings of Herodotus, we get to know that only seven of the Persian noble families could walk into the court and talk to the king whenever they feel like it. You know, I um, mean, they are like the highest aristocratic families, seven families, and only they are allowed to walk in whenever they want and talk to the king. Anyone else who wants to meet the king has to first go to the Kiliar and ask for permission. The Kiliar will discuss it with the king and get back to them whether they have got permission or not. But she can't exactly go to the Kiliar because the Kiliar is Haman. And she can't explain to him, this is, this is what I want to discuss with the king. So she cannot go to Haman, which means she has to directly go there and risk her life. If he's happy and he extends his scepter, then fine. But if he refuses to extend his scepter to her, you know, it's death sentence for her. She would just basically 
uh, get killed. So she that is why she's in a highly risky position and is not even interested in her at the moment. He's not asked for her in 30 days. So in spite of all of this, you know, she she that, those are the beautiful words she speaks, right? In chapter four, she says, if I die, I die. You know, so I yes, I will do my part. And if I'm meant to die, so be it. So rather than placing her position first, she chooses to place the people of God first. And I think the Lord really admired that stand which she took. So which is how she goes over there to the king and the Lord touches his heart so that he, you know, he treats her with favor. And uh, so Esther is able to place her request before the king. And then we all know, I mean, uh, Haman had plans for Mordecai to be hung. And then on the very uh, same pole, you know, the, the, the scaffolding which he had built for Mordecai, he himself gets hung. And uh, the Jewish people who were supposed to be massacred, uh, you know, by all the others who can take up swords, they are given the permission to take up their own swords and defend themselves. So they're able to defend themselves and they don't get killed. So all of this takes place uh, because of the intervention you know, done by one lady who really didn't have much position or power. But uh, because the Lord had placed her in that position of authority, she decided to use that for the Lord's purposes rather than use it for her own selfish purposes. So in many of these Old Testament stories, we are seeing uh, stories of people who were in important positions. And there were some like Saul who used that position for their own selfish gains. But then we see examples of others who did not, you know, the, their, their position and status didn't go to their head. They continued to revere the Lord and they placed his purposes first. And uh, we see Esther doing that over here. Uh, so, yeah, so those were some of the learnings which we could bring out uh, from this book. Uh, so, therefore, uh, you know, there's a feast which is um, which is uh, instituted to commemorate this. So, the Feast of Purim is not one of the feasts mentioned in Leviticus. This is a new feast which is created in remembrance of how God saved them, even though they were in a foreign land. Uh, you know, helpless, the Lord took care of them. So um, therefore, uh, that time onwards, the Feast of Purim is celebrated. So yes, let's close with a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you that today we could dwell upon uh, the life stories of Nehemiah and Esther. And we see that both of these people, O Lord, uh, displayed great loyalty towards you. They were both in very powerful positions. Uh, they both were very rich, but Lord, both of these characters, Nehemiah and Esther, they just set aside all of their power and riches. They didn't care about that, but Lord, they cared about your people. And they had that servant heart where they chose to serve their people rather than serve themselves. So we pray, oh Lord, that even when you take um, all of our students into ministry positions of power and influence, Lord, they would stay loyal to you rather than serving themselves. And we pray that your name would be lifted up and you would be greatly honored because of the example which they set. So we pray, O oh Lord, that you would prepare all of us for such things, that we would always place you first in our lives. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you.